in the past week. So again, very challenging. And I don't want to talk negatively about the school because I adore the students there and the teachers there and the administration there. But the things that were revealed just by asking students how they felt, or can you give me a minute? Can, can I get to know you? Can I tell you something about myself? Do you know why I'm here? I mean, just those things that teachers sometimes, because in the course of focusing on the standards, teaching the curriculum, um, all the mandates we push on them on top of that, sometimes those conversations are not at the surface. They just don't happen. Or the students are just removed. I know you've um, written some articles and done some work on, okay, so restorative discipline. Like, okay, do suspensions work? Do you just eject the child from the classroom when he's angry? So that's something I've made a point of um, in my work with children is interviewing them and not, you know, not like interrogating them, just hearing their story. Like, why are you so angry? And in this one kid, I will not forget it. And this was so hard for me not to cry listening to this child. Um, he said, do you know what it's like to have your dad ripped out of your arms because he's deported his, and his father was deported years ago. And he was telling me how he had these feelings that the teacher didn't appreciate his culture. Um, and we just got into this long conversation about it. And, and it was just weird. It was just weird and fabulous. And then I was like, why doesn't this happen all the time? Why aren't we having these conversations? Yeah, you know, I totally agree with you. And it's something that I've been thinking a lot about because I ended up taking student testimonies. And I had the same, it impacted me so hugely because I realized that we don't build in nearly enough time to sit down and let kids talk. You know, we spend so much time as teachers talking to them and telling them things and as administrators telling them what's going to happen and how it's going to be. And, you know, I think there's, there's, definitely a movement where teachers are starting to take a step back and administrators are too and it's more a collaborative model where if we could get kids to start the year off and throughout the year talk about their culture and their feelings and why they're angry and why they started swearing in a really safe environment where like you say you know mistakes um failings uh, things we feel ashamed about, the more we push them down and hide them, as you would know with your psychology background and degree, the more they are going to come out in really negative ways. So it's quite incredible that in the, right. yeah, that we haven't created a forum for kids to be able to tell the truth about what's going on in their lives and, and in their school lives. You're, you're so correct. And um, thank goodness. I also have, um, the, a side coach of mine that I call my accountability partner, this, um, wonderful woman named Brady Venables. And when I was talking about problems in the school and I, you know, I, I was like, okay, things just feel so down. I feel like the teachers are so stressed. The kids are not happy. They're struggling. There's so many issues. I, I, I don't even know where to begin to be the biggest help and to build capacity in others and, and, you know, from the ground up where, what, you know, what, what am I doing wrong? What's happened here? And um, she reminded me, she was like, don't you remember when um, at our previous district, we listened to that student panel. She's like, bring in the kids at a real forum, like ask them, Hey, what are the biggest problems here? Guys, do y'all have any solutions? I mean, that too, you said, um, we don't provide enough of a forum for the students and time to give their testimonies. So I literally booked that in my calendar to arrange that, to start next week to, okay, I'm going to find kids in like small groups. Cause you know, sometimes when kids, high schoolers are in groups, they taint what they say because they're with their peers mm -hmm. and they want to sound, you know, a certain way. So I'm, I'm struggling with, should it be a small group so they could feed off each other and um, gain things from each other? Or should it be individually at first? So I can truly hear how those individuals are, or how they feel every day walking through the halls. And do they have solutions that we just have not listened to? Well, I think personally that you would want to have both opportunities because you'll have some kids that'll choose the, I need to tell you by myself and you'll get more serious information out of them because they're talking by themselves and it's really safe and they've created that trust with you. Then you'll have other ones who actually 
you know, they're super proactive and they don't have as much at stake and they can talk and feed off each other's excitement and ideas and maybe correct each other and, and try and collaborate on what's the, what's the answer. But, um, yeah, I, I, um, I think that there should be like you have, um, in the workplace maybe, or at universities, there should every single grade or at certain points of the year, there should be like exit interviews where sort of at Christmas break, say, or winter break, kids are able to write their administrators, the transformational coach who's overseen their school and maybe their teacher and their parent. And they, maybe it's verbal for some of the kids and they get to record it. And for some it's writing or they, they have some way, even art to express what is the first term being like. And so that you get red flags with kids where first term has not been good. And these are the reasons why. And we need to start January fresh. Oh, my God. Okay, so I wrote that down because I'm doing that because that is an amazing idea to do the exit interviews, especially before breaks, Mm -hmm. where we have time to think about, okay, so what's our action plan? How can we what can we do to help here? And then also they get time to reflect on it, too. And when they come back, they might even provide us, you know, more insights into what they think is wrong in school and why is attendance so low? You know, what's going on? Do they feel safe? Well, you know what I find fascinating about your story is you are the living proof that what you learn in high school, and, and I mean, I'm a teacher, so don't take this the wrong way. Let's just put out this really <laughs> crazy idea for a second and not lose our minds, and then we'll come back to it. <laughs> but what I was going to say okay. is, you know, how much do you really learn in school? You went on to do a PhD without having any high school. So I don't think high school is going to make or break a kid in terms of how much biology, English, math they get. You can always make that time up. What you do need to get in school is happiness, a place where you belong, a safe place for your brain and body to develop, a place where you can articulate ideas and learn how to share feelings in a way that is um, reinforcing to you of your value. I mean, these are the big picture things we need. And it sounds like such a crazy idea, like, oh my God, what would happen if students didn't learn all these things and answer all these tests and so on? Well, you show that it doesn't really matter that much. You can you're a little bit delayed maybe is the worst thing that happens. <laughs> that is so true. And um, it, I love that you say this because some people, and you know, here I am working for a state department of education. Some people would say that that's kind of unicorn thinking that that just <laughs> doesn't happen. We still have state tests, blah, blah, blah. But I know I've tweeted this a couple of times before. So I was thinking, um, okay, why can't, we do just what you said, create schools where the students want to be. And my three things I um, tweet about are, I want the school to be like Disney world. Cause it is the nicest place on earth. And I just went there at the end of May with my brother and his, his three children. And everybody bends over backwards to make you feel good. Mm-hmm. Every it's, it's everywhere you turn. It's all about the experience being magical. And then, um, do you know who Ron Clark is that opened the Ron Clark Academy in Atlanta, Georgia? No. So he's like this, um, former national teacher of the year. He's been on Oprah Winfrey. Um, you know who Oprah is in Canada, right? Of course we do. Everybody knows Oprah. (laughs) I know. I was just checking, just checking. Um, so he opened this Academy in Atlanta and it's almost like a realistic Hogwarts, um, off of Harry Potter. Um, and I've been there too. I had... Um, the good luck of going there um, before they started um, charging teachers money to come visit there because they, they do a lot of fundraising because they do amazing things. And I know it's not your typical school and people say, Oh, you can't really do that. But they make that school where the kids are all about problem solving, thinking, um, creating them into the human they're going to be one day to serve others. I mean, it's just Amazing. Mm -hmm. And then Google offices is my third thing. Why can't schools be more like that where people are constantly thinking, problem solving, failing is 100% okay. You get to redo anything you want. Um, Creativity is, you know, so important. You know how Google will have like almost on-site therapists and fabulous food that's good for you. And that laughter guy that his whole job is there is to just make you giggle or something. Yeah. 
but no, those, those things can happen um, in pieces. It's just, I've, I'm looking for a way to wrap my head around it um, in the constraints of the system that we have. Well, I mean, it's like what I, I think it's perfect to use Google as an example, because while this way of thinking is absolutely taking the corporate world by storm, somehow schools are operating as if they have no relationship to the future world of work. And that's really where the breakdown happens. So I just recently read The Happiness Advantage by Sean um, Acor, and he works with the Harvard um, department. I mean, it's, I think it's out of Harvard psychology as opposed to Harvard education. But the bottom line is they <laughs> work on happiness. And the reason they do it is not because they think it's fun or unicorn thinking. They do it because the neuroscience shows that the happier people are, the more productive they are, the more they don't take sick days, the more they have brilliant ideas, and the more they're completely creative. So if we want kids to be uh, doing well at school and and not afraid to take risks and not afraid to fail or make a mistake, what we're doing is putting into place high-grade neuroscientific evidence-based practices. We're not just, you know, cracking the whip of the 19th century school system, which, you know, I mean, it can it can go by the wayside as far as I'm concerned. And again, um, cannot agree more. I struggle with, okay, the, the first steps we take to make that change, and, and that is the vision that we should have, that there is an advantage to being happy, same as... Um, with neuroscience, there's an advantage to working out. Like if you exactly um, pump up your endorphins naturally and um, all the articles I see lately about, um, you know, what a, what a horrible dishonor it is to students when you'll say like, well, you can make up that tester in PE or you can be pulled out of art, you know, that those things aren't beneficial to students or those are things they can miss. But obviously we see that the more active, people are because my probably my happiest friends are those generally in better shape because they're really kicking up those endorphins Mm -hmm. and I see to myself the days that I'm too lazy to work out or I'm like no I got to get on the computer right when I get home I feel so much worse yeah well and you know what I find so interesting too is this idea that um that somehow we need to cut back on PE because we want our kids to do so well in academics and we don't want to waste their time running around. When in actual fact, you look at the science, and this is, you know, as you would know, this is like extensive research. It's not just one kind of by-the-way study. It's extensive research proven over and over and over again that the more kids pump up oxygenated blood into their brains, the better they score in their academics. So every single time you remove recess or you take away a physical activity, you are eliminating their ability to do well because their brains... Their brains aren't getting the blood they need because they're sitting in a three-hour exam and all the blood's down in their feet. It's actually so backwards. Right. It is backwards. Um, and one of the schools I work out work at even has a room that an assistant principal, um, I think he wrote a grant to get the money, and it is like a kinesthetic room. Yeah. So you can take your students there and you can actually do all of your um, instruction while they're rock climbing on a wall or – walking on the treadmill. But honestly, we forget as a team that it's there and to utilize it and to see and see with your own eyes. Like we, you don't need to read that. Just go do it. You know, let's go experiment with the children. Let's do that. You can research ourselves in your own school with your own children, go use the kinesthetic room. And then you measure the difference. And I'm sure the students can tell you the difference. Yeah, exactly. It's, um, I think that there's a real shift in schools moving in this direction. Like teachers and administrators are pretty excited. I mean, you, when you get into a school where there's a buzz and there's change and transformation, it's because people are starting to say, well, yeah, we used to always do it this way. And that's the old school way of thinking. But it's actually harmful. I mean, it's okay. We can admit that we used to think it was a good idea and we made a mistake. And now we're going to do something different. Like, it always amazes me the people that are so afraid of doing things differently and changing. Well, change is very hard. I'm sure that's, you know, that, um, especially with adults, it's pretty hard. Um, my accountability partner and I, when we chat and we've, we've been writing about this somewhat and thinking about it, 
um, we steal this formula, this change formula from back in the 60s, 